I had been living for the past year in a transitional housing apartment provided to me by a state-run program. When I first entered the program, they told me that I'd be allowed to stay in this apartment with my two little girls for two years. And at the end of said two years, they would match any savings I had, up to $2,500. And it seemed like a dream come true. Fast forward a year and COVID-19 happens. I'm a barber, so of course, the shop where I worked was shut down. I was penniless and out of work. Thankfully, I qualified for unemployment, and it was so plentiful after the $600 boost. I fixed up my broken down car, got some much needed dental work done, and started to repair my credit. With so much money circulating in my pocket, I decided to invest that money into opening my own shop as soon as the lockdown was over. This way, when it comes time to move on from this place, I'll be in a good place to start fresh. So fast forward again about two months after quarantine, and my business is doing well. I'm not really making money, but I'm also not losing a ton of money either. I am my own boss, which means that I have more time with my kids. At this point, I'm feeling so very blessed, and every day I feel so thankful for my new windfall. One day I get a call from my case manager asking me for my income details. No. This is not unheard of in this program, but it is strange because technically I'm unemployed as far as they know, so I don't have any income. So I give them all the information they ask for, and about a week later, I get a message from them saying that I no longer qualify for the program because I make too much money on unemployment, and that I should have used that extra money to secure stable housing. I try to explain that I couldn't find stable housing because I'm unemployed, and that the boost is temporary but they can't be reasoned with. However, this whole journey so far has been more than I could have ever hoped for, and as much as it saddens me and honestly shocks me, I really can't complain too much. So, I start the hunt for a new apartment. As a barber, I usually chat with my clients all day every day, just about random stuff, but usually we end up telling stories about our lives and what's going on in our day-to-day. So I'm talking to my clients, a guy and his wife, about my apartment hunt and how I have to be out within the month. I have horrible credit and I can't pass any income verification because honestly, I have none. My shop isn't making money and I'm basically living on unemployment at the moment. So my clients, who happen to be Serbian, basically tell me that if I have the hurdles to overcome, the easiest way to get past them is to look in areas where there are lots of immigrants, because a lot of them are overcoming the same hurdles. So they tell me not to worry. My apartment search is done. At this point, the month is more than half over, and I don't have many options. I'm trusting them, but I'm still looking on my own as well. About a week before the end of the month, my dad calls me and says he wants me and the girls to move in with them. He lives about an hour from my barber shop and my girl's school, and the commute in the winter will be awful. It's not an ideal situation, but I guess for now, it's the best option I have. So I start making plans to move in with him. About two days after that, I get a call from my client and his wife. They told me that they're moving and had a word with their landlord. If I want their apartment, then it's mine. Long story short, I'm elated. They live one block away from my current apartment, which is about a block from my kids' schools, and five minutes from my shop. They tell me that I can come over and check out the apartment. Of course, I drop everything right then and there and head over. The apartment is gorgeous. It has high ceilings, two spacious bedrooms, and even a separate dining room which is huge as well. It must be at least double the size of my current apartment, and for only $400 extra per month in rent. I am so happy I could cry. I thank them profusely and ask them about the landlord and the other tenants. Basically, I'm just making conversation, because obviously I'm taking this apartment. They tell me that the landlord is a sweet old man, and that his daughter can be a bit bitchy, but we rarely ever have to deal with her. The neighbors are all very sweet. And even though the people upstairs can be kind of loud, they aren't bad either. He tells me that the guy across the hall just moved in with his daughter a few months ago, but they pretty much keep to themselves. 
then my client and his wife joke about how he tends to have a lot of lady callers, who they assume to be sex workers because they all seem pretty young and scantily clad. We all laugh a bit and I thank them again. I head straight home and resume packing. Later that night, I get another email from my case manager about how I needed to be out of the apartment soon. At this point, I'm so thankful for my clients because I was feeling hopeless and like I was slowly falling into a depression before they gave me this amazing gift. So fast forward another week, and it's finally time to secure my lease and get my new keys. The landlord is a bit apprehensive once he finds out I'm a single mom and a new business owner. He thinks that I won't be able to afford the rent, but he basically takes a chance on me. I'm still grateful for the good news, and even though I'm a little scared and unsure about my new predicament, I'm optimistic as well. Here's where things get weird. So I gave the landlord my deposit and received my keys. The first thing I did was paint my new apartment. After about 12 hours of non-stop painting, not only was I exhausted, I was starving. The only thing was that I was covered in paint and really didn't have the energy to shower, let alone leave my place for food. I didn't have much money at this point, but I figured I deserved a little job well done splurge. So I ordered Chipotle on Uber Eats. As soon as I put my phone down and really settled into the quiet of my new apartment, I started feeling weird, just kind of creeped out. Maybe because I was by myself, or maybe because this place was unfamiliar to me, but it was like a strange, hair-raising feeling. So I called my boyfriend to come over. After about 20 long, creepy, hungry minutes, I finally got the call from my Uber driver guy that my food was here. I could hear something that sounded like sobbing in the background, but I brushed it off and ran to the door to grab the meal. As I'm heading to the front door, I notice two things. The apartment door across the hall is wide open, and the sobbing is coming from these two young girls standing at the front door. They look to be about 15 or 16, and they aren't just sobbing, they're wailing. I walk past the wailing teens and grab my food from the guy, who looks at me with panic in his eyes and he takes off quickly. In my head, I register it as odd, but I don't really think twice about it. Instead, I now focus in on the two girls to my right. Hey, you girls okay? I ask hesitantly. One of the girls has her phone in her hand, and I hear the woman on the other end ask who I am. No. My dad is in bed and he's naked. Something just doesn't look right, the girl with the phone wails. The other girl grabs her other hand and they begin sobbing again. I immediately jump into mom mode. I'm imagining this idiot dad in a drunken passed out state, scaring the hell out of his kids. I hear the person on the phone say that she's going to call the police. I tell her that I'm the neighbor across the hall and that I'm going to check it out. So I head with the two girls up to my apartment to sit my food down, and then I tell them to take me to their dad. At this point I'm extremely irritated with this guy who I don't even know because of how irresponsible it is to get that drunk midday, knowing your kid would be home any minute. As the girls are leading me through their apartment, I'm noticing that it's pretty much empty. Just one lamp in the living room, and one plant pot on the counter in the kitchen. Weird. They moved in months ago, I thought. I brushed off the thought as I realized the girls had stopped walking. Jeez, they are really scared. I look back at the girl with the phone to reassure her that he's probably fine, and she doesn't come any closer. He's naked, she warns. She hands me a blanket randomly. I didn't even notice that she'd grabbed it. I turn back to the door in front of me and ask her if this is where he is. She nods, but doesn't come any closer. Sir? I call out, not wanting to freak him out. Sir? I called out again, a little more cautiously this time. There is no answer, no sound at all, so I slowly push open the door. My eyes immediately flash to the only thing in the room, which is the bed. The room is brightly lit from the sun outside, and I quickly glance away from the obviously naked figure laying spread eagle in the bed. Sir? I repeat trying to be respectful of the fact that I'm in his home, and he is naked, and that I'm a stranger. Still nothing. 
Not a sound. I slowly look back over to the bed. Now I'm examining the full picture. He's definitely naked. Very naked. I'm not wearing my glasses, of course. So I step just a bit closer into the room. As I do this, I realize that he's wearing an empty condom. His chest is raised unnaturally into the air, and his head is back in an extremely unnatural angle as well. As my eyes take in even more detail, I notice that his fingers are curled and the tips of them are black, and that from the top of his chest to his chin is black as well. I stare at his chest for a while to confirm what I was beginning to suspect. He's dead. Very dead. It looks like he wasn't home alone when he died. Someone left him like this. I slowly back out of the room and closer to the door as I leave. The girls are still in the hallway. Is he okay? The girl and the woman on the phone ask simultaneously. I pull the girls with me into my apartment. I tell them that I don't know and ask who the woman on the phone is. She tells me that it's her mother. I ask the girl for her phone and tell her to have a seat in my living room while I speak to her mom in private. Ma'am, where are you? I ask, trying to keep my voice calm. The woman is on FaceTime and I can see the panic in her face. I'm in Texas. Is he dead? She asks me with a hand over her mouth. At this point, I don't even know how to break the news to her. Ma'am, I don't know for sure because I'm no trained professional, but he's not moving and his fingers are black. And I respond trying to be respectful and also convey the urgency of the situation. Is he dead? She asks again, this time more panicked. I don't know, ma'am. All I know is that he sure doesn't look alive, I reply, and this time I was a bit more forceful. Her hand flies to her mouth and she wails and hangs up the phone. I walk out of my bedroom and into the living room to return the phone to the girls. Only they aren't there. I walk back towards their apartment to find them heading back in. No, sweetie. You guys should come sit with me until... I am then cut off by an officer walking into the unit as I'm leading the girls back into the hallway. It is only at this point do I realize how suspicious this could all look. I point the officer into the guy's bedroom. He turns and looks at me and asks who I am. He questions me for a while, but after seeing all the paint on me, he decides that I'm probably not a person of interest and he lets me go back to my apartment. Just then, about four other officers fill the tiny hallway between the two units, and the girl's uncle shows up and leads them down the stairs to speak with the officers. I go back to my place, and the rest of the day kind of goes by in a blur. Eventually everything goes quiet, and my boyfriend gets to my place. He comforts me and tells me that there's still a few officers in the hallway. They don't leave completely until well after one in the morning, they also didn't move the body for a while either. It was also very surreal. My boyfriend kept asking me how I did not hear anything, and I just kept telling him how I was so focused on my painting. I just feel so horrible for those poor girls. Can you imagine that being the last way you saw your dad? I know I can't unsee it. Here we are a whole week later. We still don't know what happened to him. However... I just keep thinking about my clients telling me about the sex workers and strange women. Another thing that I can't get out of my head is that I heard those kids come home. I remember because they flew into the parking lot behind our building. I remember making a mental note to remind my kids to be careful when walking to the car. I heard them giggling in the hallway between our apartments. The girls got home at least three hours before I found them in the doorway crying. That means they were home for at least three hours with their dad in the next room. I still have that weird, creepy, hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck. What a nice welcoming to the new building. Next time, I'll probably just mind my own business. For a bit of backstory, I live in a not-so-safe area. The block I am on is okay, but if you walk down my street a block or two, you could get shot, offer drugs, be mugged, or so much more. When we leave the house, we head up a side street that gets us away from trouble. Like I said, my block isn't bad, 
We all get along here. Most people on this block are related to each other. We're well, all but for my household. But even though we're strangers to the neighbors, they are nice to us. The people right next door have dogs, as well as a few other households. Again, we are the odd ones out in the apartment as well. The dogs only bark when someone is out on the block that doesn't live here. I have always felt safe because of those dogs. I live in a home converted into a duplex. When you walk in the front door, you're in the entryway, and then across the entryway, you see my apartment door. And then if you go up the stairs beside my door, you find the door to the second apartment. The front door to the house has no lock mechanism at all. It's so all tenants can not lock each other out of the house. We can only lock the doors to our apartments. When you come into the entryway, a motion sensing light comes on. No one is currently living in the upstairs apartment right now, so at this time, it's just me and my husband living in the place. Two nights ago, my husband was in bed, and I was up watching TV. I was all relaxed and thinking about going to bed soon, being as it was nearly 1am. Suddenly I got this overwhelming uncomfortable feeling. I felt hot and sick in my stomach. I had the intrusive thought that I needed to check the apartment door out to make sure it was locked. I tried to brush it off, but I couldn't. So I got up to look. Just as I got there, I heard someone open the screen door on the outer house door. I looked and the door was locked. Then I heard the actual door to the house open and then someone step into the entryway. I was terrified. I know no one lives upstairs, and my landlord said he would let me know if someone was moving in. We don't get visitors this late or without a phone call first. Also, with this pandemic and social distancing, no one should be coming over. And then I heard a click. I recognize the click as the sound the motion light makes when it turns on. Then I hear a male voice say, Oh shit, and the sound of someone running out of the house. I was terrified. I stood there trying to process what just happened, from the time I heard the screen door open until a solid minute after the person ran out, I stood there frozen. The neighborhood dogs were barking their heads off all that night, and they only do that if someone is around they don't know. I think someone who doesn't know that the house is a duplex attempted to let themselves in. The light, which is way too bright for that tiny entryway, came on, and then scared the person away. I woke up my husband and we called the police. They said that since the person wasn't trying to get into my apartment, they weren't going to come out. The best they would do is drive by a few times. Yeah, real comforting. Last night, I was again up late. The dogs were barking like crazy yet again. A little after midnight, I hear a noise. I mute the TV. I realize someone is pounding, not knocking, but full-on pounding on the outer house door. Not my apartment door, thank God, but I was freaked out. I wanted to go in and wake my husband up, but I didn't. There's a window besides the outer house door where he was knocking, and that window is our bedroom window. Because my husband was sleeping and the living room lights were on, but off in the bedroom, I thought if I opened the door, the person standing on the porch hammering on the door would see the light and then know someone was here. I was afraid to let whoever was out there know someone was home. I just sat there. There was over ten minutes of banging. It was not stopping. I thought maybe it was the police because of the call I made the night before. So I called the police and told them what was happening and about what happened the night before. And also about my call to them the night before. I asked them if it could be the police at my door. The dispatch said he would look into it. And then he said as far as he could tell, whoever it was was not the police. He also said not to open the door that he was sending police out, and if someone was still banging on the door, they would talk to them. And then he said to me he would call when he knew what was going on. The banging stopped five minutes after hanging up with the police, but I never got a phone call. I don't even know if the police even showed up. The next night, the dogs are really barking, and they've been doing that for the past hour. My husband decided that I'm going to bed early, and he's staying up. I doubted I'd sleep anyway. I made him promise that no matter what he hears, he won't unlock and open the front door. So whenever I go to bed alone, I put the TV on, and it helps me fall asleep. The following day, my husband told me that the neighborhood dogs were barking like mad. 
but nothing happened. I'm thinking that they realized that someone was home and possibly awake. My husband usually comes in to check on me, and if I'm asleep, he turns off the TV, but he left it on until really late. Who knows who it was? It could have been two different people here on two consecutive nights, at roughly around the same time, but regardless of whoever it was, I just hope never to meet this person. I've done quite well for myself as an adult, but when I was younger we were very poor. In middle school, I lived in government housing projects that were like little one-level apartments with two apartments sharing a wall each, all spaced out. There were woods directly behind a cluster of apartments, with no gate in between, but no one ever went into the woods, which I learned the reason for due to this incident. These apartments were very poorly made and the windows could easily be popped in and out, never mind a lock. The front door was somewhat sturdy, but with a good kick, it would have easily been opened. My dad was a pretty stocky bodybuilder type, so I had a false sense of security and would leave my window blinds open at night, as my room faced some trees that would blow in the wind. I loved nature and wasn't afraid of the dark, so I liked watching the trees as I fell asleep. Our apartment's front door was facing the woods, as was my friends behind ours with our building block their view. As you walk in through the front door, the hallway is on the left. My room was at the end of the hallway on the right. My big window that took up most of the wall was on the left, and my bed was sideways facing both walls, so I could lay on my side and watch the trees. The woods were about a field away facing our front door, so I couldn't see it from my room. This was just a small area of trees and vegetation. One night, I woke up feeling a sense of unease, and through my sleepy haze, made out the figure of a large man standing at my window, watching me sleep with total confidence, not caring one bit if he was seen. He was in a big coat and looked quite burly, and average to taller height. It was black in my room and outside just barely illuminated by the moonlight. I had just cracked open my eyes and I froze once I realized what I was seeing. I kept my eyes as closed as possible, just enough to peer at him in the darkness. I rolled out of my bed to the side, not facing the window, and I shouted for my dad who was across the hall with both our doors open as I crawled out. Not the smartest, but I was a dumb 12-year-old. He hadn't gone to sleep yet, and he was in my room in a heartbeat as the guy took off. He went to run out the front door, yelling threats as well, which probably wasn't smart, but the guy was gone. I truly believe he never came after this, just due to my dad's sheer size and build, but I'll never know. A few nights later, I was spending the night at my friends who lived directly behind us with the same layout. Her room was the first room on the left, with her window facing our apartment block. Her sister's was the second on the left, and her mom and toddler sister were in the room on the right. Like mine in my own apartment, we finished watching Dave Chappelle and went to do one another's hair in her room, with her older sister helping us. Her mother and little sister went to bed. Not long after, we heard screaming from her mom's room and heavy stomping feet. Her older sister swung open the door to the room we were in, and it was just a huge flash of a man in his 30s to 40s, running down the hall towards the living room, and then out the front door. Her mom was chasing him with a butcher knife, hacking at the air and screaming bloody murder. The man flew out the door and towards the woods. As soon as he left, her mom locked the door and called the cops. This man had the audacity to pop open the window and crawl into the bed that was pushed against the window just slightly under it not realizing this woman was a whole Amazon warrior who slept with a butcher knife and would wake up to protect her baby. She was quick and it slashed at him, although I am not sure of the damage since I was ushered home directly after. The police went into the woods to look for him. They did find him, but he was with another man quite similar to him. They were both hiding and living out there together. 
they were also responding to a call from a frantic mother whose little girl had been taken that day as well from our housing units. And they found her with those creeps. She had been there all day and night with them. She was only around three to four years old. They were taken to jail, and that's the last I heard of it. The adults didn't let us in on the conversation. The poor little girl was probably traumatized. I just hope she's been able to heal. I can't even imagine what would have happened if my friend's mom hadn't been so quick and slept with the weapon. But what if he had decided to fight instead of run? I still don't understand why he didn't try to overpower her, but I guess it's possible she heard him. After this, my dad explained to me how sometimes drug addicts or homeless people would hang around in these woods. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. Do me a favor and drop a like on this video. Leave a comment as well and let me know what you thought of the stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And also turn on notifications. So you're always kept up to date with my latest videos. I want to give a shout out to my patrons for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Courtney Maxwell, Alex, Monica Levelace, Gemma Allen, James Gorgano, Kathleen Fenton, Sarah P, Jody, Shan, Linda, Fire05, Lulu Rogers, Noosh, Christina De La Rosa, Rochelle, Rudy, and Estora Rain. If anyone else wants to check out my Patreon, Reddit, or Twitter, all my links in the description. I hope the week's going great for you guys and you're all doing well. And with that, I'll see you guys on the next one.